Welcome to the Living Myth Podcast with Michael Mead, where this shifting, changing world is looked at from a mythic perspective. This episode considers how the path of discovery will inevitably raise the exact fears that hold the heart captive. Under the rule of the ego or little self, we live on the fringes of our natural potential and our genuine purpose in life. A core pattern exists in each soul intended to shape the unique project of that life from within. Whenever we experience a life transition or personal crisis, the esoteric pattern and latent genius within us tries to awaken. As a result, at each turning point in life, we must face our deepest fears in order to grow. The assumption or the old idea is everybody, no matter who they are or what their life circumstances, has been born as an inheritor of the deep treasury of the human soul. And the treasury of the soul has all this kind of inner inner abundance of ideas and imagination and access to archetypal energies, which naturally can give us a a, a response to the conditions of the world. The hidden gift inside a spiritual or an emotional crisis is the potential for a psychological breakthrough and an awakening of the soul. So the old idea is the troubles that we encounter in the world individually and collectively are there to awaken things that are hidden inside. This abundance of spirit and imagination and emotion and things that can actually bring not just vital energy, but new imagination to the world. And that happens through the individual human. Transformation, as they used to say, is the secret aim of all the troubles we encounter in life. This is not a kind of a naive idea. It's actually a deeper idea that the soul came here to transform. And the troubles we encounter are the obstacles that provoke the turning within which leads to the finding of the deep resources of the self and soul. That's the understanding of the dynamic from the point of view of the soul. Another little idea that I like a lot, when we go through a crisis, there's only two possible outcomes. We either come out as a bigger soul or we come out as a smaller person. The idea is to accept the circumstances, whatever they might be individually and collectively as well now. We're in a kind of, I call it a collective rite of passage, an attempt to transform a culture from the inside out. Um, But I'll repeat the idea because it's really intriguing. If it's a real crisis, whether it's just strictly personal or collective, you can't come out the same. If you came out the same, it wasn't a real crisis, not enough to cause change or transformation. But it's either going to cause a person to expand, grow, awaken the depths of their own soul, open their mind and open their heart. Either that's going to happen or else the opposite has to happen. There's very little neutral in life. Another idea, the world is on the threshold of change a collective rite of passage, change from an old world view to one that's just forming, because that view is over now. We've already left it behind. Um, And this threshold, because it's a collective rite of passage and also a transformation of the world, you can tell that because it involves everything from climate to the most personal things, that makes it a very big threshold. And part of our task right now is to find our place on the, tre- on the threshold. What in each of us is trying to change and is capable of bringing something imaginative, creative, soulful, meaningful into the world? So I call it finding your place on the threshold. The good news is that the inner abundance of the soul is always nearby and it exists in, in, in everyone. Um, the problem is that the paths to awakening the soul are blocked by a number of things. Fear is one of those things. 
an over-adaptation to early life. In other words, in order to survive our childhood, our infancy, and then early childhood, we had to adapt to family and community circumstances, but humans typically over-adapt, and then that over-adaptation becomes a, 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 a way to get stuck or trapped from the greater movement of the soul and the imagination uh, that comes as the core deep gift of the soul. Um, and then another blockage comes from received ideas, the ideas of the family, the ideas of the community, sometimes the ideas of a relig religious affiliation, whatever it is. And we have no defensive against those ideas. We're undefended, we're dependent, and, and so we take them in. And what originally might have been something that gave shape to the personality later becomes that which just traps us or keeps us from becoming a bigger person. Um, so at first we have to adapt just to live. Later that adaptation becomes a trap. And then fixed beliefs that exist in a culture. Uh, here in the United States, we're going through this big struggle about fixed beliefs of different kinds. And it's a battle uh, between things that are too fixed and that are not ready to flow with the transformation that's trying to happen in the world, as if to say uh, the earth gets fixed in the springtime that's trying to rise from within, can't get through the concrete of the earth. We're in that concrete idea, fixed idea level. Um, and yet transformation is trying to happen. And then just this other idea, a profound loss of vitality occurs as a result of what's called domesticated libido. Libido means vital life energy. And everyone has access to an abundance of vital life energy because everyone has a soul and a deep self, and that's where the vital life energy comes from. But a longing and our capacity to transform and grow often has become domesticated, has become trapped in ideas that are too small for the nature of our own souls. This is a common thing. Um, and so um, the soul is wanting continuous transformation all the way to the divine. There's something in each soul that's divine, otherwise we couldn't even think about the divine. Where do we get the idea from? It's somewhere inside. Um, but most of us have had our vitality and even our libido constricted, and we carry received ideas and rigid beliefs. And this is a time when those things can trap us in the things like fear and anxiety. So that's like the premise or the two premises, the extremes of the world and the ways that our souls, which are connected to eternal things and connected to the very vitality of nature, become trapped and restricted and blocked. So I want to focus primarily on fear. Um, uh, fear, some people say, is the enemy. Fear is one of the greatest restrictions that we experience. And I want to read a poem from William Stafford. He calls it, For my young friends who are afraid. He means us. There is a country to cross you will find in the corner of your eye, in the quick slip of your foot, the air far down, and a snap that might have caught. And maybe for you, maybe for me, a high passing voice that finds its way by being afraid. That country is there. It's there for us. It's carried as it is crossed. So listen, what you fear will not go away. It will take you into yourself, and it will bless you, and it will keep you, for that's the world, and we all live there. So poets, you know, they have to go where the imagination and the muses take them. That's a bunch of radical ideas in there. The idea that, first of all, fear won't go away, but it's trying to take us somewhere. And so um, fear is deeply misunderstood, especially because people mostly associate the effects of fear with the essence of fear. The old saying was, fear is a guide. Well, fear is only a guide if you respond to it right away. If we respond to the presence of fear, the rising of fear, the presence of the emotion, then you're not paralyzed and trapped. Um, but most people actually 
stop or don't respond to the presence of fear. And nowadays, people are even afraid of fear. You have fear of fear. Now fear has become, because it's been used to manipulate people so much, you have people that are afraid to be afraid. So I want to say a few more things about fear. Not life, not even death, but our own fears that can be pre-verbal as well as unconscious, that can be the enemy. So we have fears that are automatic, even pre-verbal. Um, and when they're triggered, then we can be carried away, fear as flight, or we can be carried into fight. That's being used politically a lot right now. Um, or we can become paralyzed and afraid to move. It was Emerson who said, fear defeats more people than any other thing in the world. Fear has been the death of many great projects that never began. Fear is a very strong emotion. It can erase the sense of imagination, and it can obliterate the vision needed both for survival and for renewal. And I'm focusing on fear because there's no way to transform without facing fear. To repeat what the poet said, the problem is that what we fear will not simply go away. What, what is being avoided when we stay away from fear is an inner passage that's required to find the deeper connection to truth and beauty and meaning all the things of the soul. Our greatest fears actually mark the places where we must go or risk losing our soul. So fear, which tends to be avoided or people think we shouldn't have it or should avoid it, is actually an indication of where we have to go. This is viewed from the soul. This is viewed from the sense of transformation. The word fear comes from the old English word fair, as in thoroughfare. And that word means something like uh, going on a journey or starting an expedition. So fear has these two sides. It's become commonly associated with being stuck in fear, being paralyzed, being trapped, being overwhelmed with fear. But the meaning of the word itself is something like thoroughfare or to go through. Fear, in a sense, means to go all the way through. And so if we're going to transform ourselves, if we're going to transform the world, we're going to have to understand something about the nature of fear, which is always provoked when something meaningful is about to happen and is especially provoked when radical change is underway. And so as far as I can tell, we're in the radical change on all levels of life, and therefore fear is continuously provoked and if we can't understand it better and find ways to work with it or let us lead it where it wants to take us, we can wind up stuck and in that getting smaller in the crisis, uh, shrinking or the shrinking of the soul. That makes me think of one of my favorite stories. And a couple of things about story. One is it's not necessary or even the point to understand the whole story. The story is a territory. No one can ever understand all of it. Uh, the idea is to feel invited into the story, to let the story come into a person. It begins to awaken things inside. Uh, and then notice what strikes you most about the story and, and try to remember that or even write it down if you can do that uh, because that becomes the key back into the story. Story means storehouse. The things that people forget that are really important are not lost, they fall back into the stories. The old stories are there to remind everybody of the nature of the world and the nature of life, and usually the nature of change and transformation because that's what stories are about. If you have a story where it starts out, you know, this person is this way and it ends up that they're the same way, that's not really a story. Um, it's a story because transformation occurs. This story is a like a folk myth, I call it, from Asia, told in a number of areas in Asia. And it begins with a young woman who is concerned that she may never be able to love again. She had experienced love with one person, and he had been called into a war that happened, and he had survived the war, but he came back a changed person. And when he came back, 
Even when they were near each other, they, knew, they were no longer close to each other. Something had changed in him. And sometimes he was too close in the sense that he would become irritable or angry. And sometimes he was just distant, looking far into the distance as if at some extensive ocean where something got lost in him. And so because of that, she lost her sense of love and began to fear that she could never love again. And eventually he left and she carried her fear, her concern that she could never love out into the world, looking for some kind of cure or some kind of antidote antidote or solution to this loss that she was feeling, the loss of love. And at that time, it was a troubled world also. And wherever she went, she found more trouble. And that somehow intensified her own fear of loss, particularly the loss of love. Eventually, she went back to her hut in the village where she lived, a simple place at the foot of a mountain. And when she went back, she overheard some people talking, and one of them was talking about a wise old sage that lived in a cave up in the mountain somewhere, and how that old sage was able to produce potions and, and medicines and cures for all kinds of things. And so she realized that may be where she had to go to get the cure. So the next day when the sun rose up, she got up. And as the sun was rising into the sky, she was going up the path that led up to the cave in the mountains. And eventually she got there. And when she arrived at the opening of the cave, she realized she was standing in the light, looking into darkness. And she waited for a minute and then entered it in. And as soon as she entered, she lost her vision because it was all dark and her eyes couldn't adjust that quickly. And she stood for a moment in the darkness. And after a while, she could see there was a small flickering light somewhere in the back of the cave. And so she carefully went back towards the flickering light and ev eventually came to where she could see the shape of a person bent a little bit, sitting before a small fire. And she realized that must be the sage. And so she quietly came up, realizing she was interrupting an almost sacred silence that was in the cave. And she said, excuse me for interrupting the silence, but I came looking for a cure. And the old sage responded, a cure, a cure, the whole world looking for a cure. And she said, what? And, and she didn't know what to say. And then the sage said, and what can I do? What can anyone? And she said, I didn't come here to answer questions. I came looking for an answer to my question, a cure to my ailment. And the sage kind of recovered and said, oh, all right, excuse me. Uh, what's the problem? And she told about losing the lover and losing her sense of love and feeling that she may never find love again and having all this fear and so on. And the sage listened and then said, all right, there is a cure for your ailment. And if you come back in three days, I'll tell you what it is. She didn't know what to do. She bowed and said, thank you. She quietly left, went back down the trail, went to her hut and spent the next three days and nights the way you spend time waiting to find out, is there a cure and what is the cure? And after the three days, one morning, she whined, got up and climbed the path back up as the sun was rising in the sky, once again stood on the outside in the light, and then stepped into the dark, lost her vision for a moment, waited until she could see the flickering of the fire, quietly went to the sage and said, excuse me for interrupting the silence, but I came to find out, is there a cure? And the sage says, yes, there is a cure, and I have gathered all the ingredients that are needed in order to effect the cure, all that is except for one. There's one ingredient missing, and I wonder if you could gather that. And of course, the young woman said, whatever it is, I'll do whatever it takes, go wherever I have to. I will gather that last ingredient to make the cure. And the sage, sage said, all right, what's needed is the whisker from the head of a tiger. Exactly what's needed is the whisker from the head of a living tiger. And the young woman said, what? Are you telling me that all the other ingredients were as difficult to find as the one you're assigning to me? The sage didn't answer, and she went on, and she said, this is kind of outrageous. I don't know that I could do this. And the sage said, you just said you would do whatever it takes. You would go wherever you had to go. And the young woman realized she had said that. And she said, 
okay, thank you. And she left the cave, entered back into the brightness of the world, descended to her hut, not having any idea how she could possibly get a whisker from the head of a living tiger. And it's something maybe for us to think about since we're here thinking about fear. What would it be like for each one of us to go searching for something we're not sure about, but we think we need, in fact, to heal or cure ourselves? Anyway, that's what she was thinking about. And since she ate a kind of simple diet, she tended to cook rice. She would find herself in the evening especially thinking about this problem and how was she going to find this ingredient. And one evening while she was cooking her rice and the steam was rising as if she could see something in the steam, she suddenly got the idea, well, wait, a tiger would need food, so maybe I should prepare food for a tiger. And then she remembered that, in fact, there was another path going up the same mountain, but on the other side, and people said it led to a cave where there lived a tiger. So now she had an idea of where to go, a path forward, and she had the idea that maybe if she brought food that a tiger needs to eat, she could make an offering in that way, get close to the tiger. And it occurred to her that tigers tend to be man-eating and they might actually be woman-eating as well. And so she decided to put some meat in with the rice. And that night, as the darkness was descending from the mountain down to the village, she went up the other path and she went as far as she could go, walking, stepping into her fear as far as she could go. And she put the bowl of rice and meat down and turned around and hurried back to the hut. The next night she took another bowl of food up and when she arrived at the place where she had left the rice and the meat before, the bowl was empty and she realized the tiger must have eaten it. She stepped over that bowl, went as far as she could go before the fear overwhelmed her, returned, picked up the other bowl, went back to the hut and she did that night after night, each night going further than the night before. And then finally, one night, when the moon was rising and dropping its liquid white light down on the path of the mountain, as she came upon the bowl, she could see the tiger coming towards her. And now her fear really intensified. But she had taken this path. She had made this practice. And so once again, she picked up the empty bowl, put down the full one and waited. And the tiger came and began to eat. And while the tiger was eating, the young woman said, please forgive me for interrupting your meal and forgive me for taking something from you. But I have been told that it will help cure what ails my heart. So please forgive me. And as she said that, she reached out grabbed a whisker of the tiger right next to where its great teeth was eating the food she had placed, and she pulled the whisker and stepped back, and the tiger pretended not to notice. And at that point, she realized she had the whisker, and all she had to do was return, and she turned and she went down the path while the moon was shining down on her and the earth, and she began to sing and even danced a little, she had gone all the way through her fears. She had found the whisker. She had found the missing ingredient to create the medicine to heal her own heart and her own soul. And she danced and sang her way down. And that night she couldn't rest at all. And in the morning when the sun rose up, she got up and she followed up the path as the sun rose in the sky. Once again, stepped from the light into the dark, refocused her vision and there went to where the fire was crackling and the old sage was ne leaning over the fire and said, excuse me for interrupting the silence, but I'm here and I have found the cure. And the old sage, sage said, hand it over to me. I need to check to make sure that it's really the whisker from the head of a living tiger. And she handed it over and the sage held it up in the light of the fire and looked at it. And after a moment, just let it drop, and it dropped into the fire where it instantly was turned into ash and then mixed in the ashes at the base of the fire, never to be seen again. And the young woman said, how could you? How dare you? You sent me out there to face a living tiger, and when I bring back the ingredient that's needed to finish the cure, you simply destroy it. How can you do that? And she carrying on, of course all that she had experienced, and now it seemed like it was all lost at the last minute. And the sage just quietly said, answer a question for me. Is a human heart more fierce than the heart of a tiger? Is the fear that you faced 
more fierce than the energy of your own life? And the young woman was confused for a moment, and then she realized what was being asked, what was being said. And she realized then what had happened. And when she realized that, she simply bowed again to the sage and said, thank you for the medicine, thank you for the teaching, thank for the, you for the forbearance and the listening. And then she turned and she left the cave and stepped back into the bright world and descended down the path and went back to life. And the story doesn't say what happened after that. It just says that she returned to life and she continued on the path that she had now learned to walk on. And so that's the end of the story. So you can see how the story is about fear, about facing fear, even embracing fear. You can see how the story is about fear on one, fear in the middle, the sage on one side, the tiger on another, and the human being caught in the midst between those two paths. And I think it's also clear that in order to go on the path of transformation, she completely transforms in that process by going step by step through her fear, by encountering a living tiger. Notice, of course, The tiger pretends not to notice what happened, as if maybe the tiger is in on it somehow. And she goes through that transformation, and then she has her expectation about what's going to happen and how this potion medicine is going to be made. And it turns out that it's made a different way than she ever could have imagined. And she leaves there with the cure, but kind of the realization that what she was looking for was inside anyway. That's part of the message of the sage. And part of the message of the story is to say, each one of us has somewhere inside a wise old sage that knows something about the medicine that we need. And each of us has surprisingly inside a living tiger or something like a living breather tiger, something as vital, something as brilliant, something as stunning as a tiger. So that's part of the sense of the inner abundance, part of the um, the kind of how fear operates, both as something that stops us and something that leads us. And it has this sense of uh, transformation that I just find wonderful. The story itself is a path. The story itself is a practice. And what matters is to figure out what in the story is talking directly to you. Because stories have a way of coming directly to the person. And they come to the place in us that is questioning and ready to be on a quest. When we step into our fears... We wind up in a place, it's not that there aren't fearful elements there. It's not that there aren't, you know, forces that could be overwhelming. A tiger is a prime example of that. But the other world, you could say, I mean, the story has a lot of other world in it. Each of the caves is part of the other world. And each of the caves, by the way, might be secretly connected. So the other world or the divine the imaginative, is trying to come to us. And so we don't even have to go all the way. It's coming towards us, as in the story. Once we go far enough, it's coming towards us. What we really fear is becoming ourselves. The most fearful thing to most of us is to become who we actually already are at our core. I don't know how to unwind that myself, but that seems to me pretty evident that most of us are afraid to become who we are in our essence. So the tiger is there as a symbol. I mean, it's a tremendous symbol because it is this fearful animal, this instinctive animal, but it is made compellingly beautiful, striped, and, you know, forget camouflage, you know, uh, There are many animals that use camouflage. The tiger can't really do that. It's made, as William Blake said, shining bright. The other thing about a tiger is a tiger can't change its stripes. That's the old saying. The tiger, well, that's our own soul. Our own soul can't change its stripes. 
And so it's really an encounter of the self or the soul and the way that we're striped and the way that we're made. And it seems very fearful, that encounter, but it's actually been waiting to happen our entire lives. To become who we are at our core is to be a truly unique being. And that has problems when you go back against the things I men mentioned earlier. Received ideas, collective beliefs, understandings inside our family, all those things tend to be gathered in the shape, let's say, of the ego or the little self and the unique self who we actually originally are and are intended to be. Carl Jung called it the intended personality, has to break through those things because it's bigger than those things. It's brighter. It's more imaginative. It's more creative than those things. But in order to become the living expression of our own self and soul, we have to walk through and get past all the stories inside the family about shame and guilt and blame and all the ideas. I mean, I don't know, you know, if you know yourself, then you know what kind of curses and what kind of uh, spells you're carrying. In my case, my father, who had a third grade education and probably really resented me going to school and, and even doing well at times in school, and also obviously resented my vitality as a kid because he worked all the time on the docks and driving trucks in Manhattan. That was his life. And he had no or very little opportunity to be spontaneous. He secretly wanted to be a writer. He had a third grade education. That probably wasn't going to happen. So then as a child in the house, um, spontaneous and exuberant in ways that he can't be. So he would always be saying to me, who do you think you are? You know, that idea that you can't be someone because you're part of us. You're, you're a, a, a poor person. You're uh, uneducated or all that kind of stuff. And when a child hears that enough in different ways from the family and from the community, in the community I grew up in, the same thing would happen. People say you're putting on airs when you're trying to, you know, just kind of air out some part of your soul. And so that begins to shrink the sense of self and the sense of soul. And the next thing, we become afraid to be ourselves. I'll tell you another reason why it's, it's fearful to be oneself. Everyone is gifted. That's the old idea. It's the understanding of the soul. No one has an empty soul. Everybody came bringing gifts. The hidden abundance of the soul was given to each one of us in, in a particular arrangement. And we're here to give those gifts. But if you start giving those gifts and everybody around you hasn't awakened to their gifts, the next thing people could be criticizing you, rejecting you, envious of you, all kinds of things, because who do you think you are? to be doing that when other people aren't doing it. So it becomes quite a challenge to fully express oneself. And if you look at when someone's talents and gifts are recognized in the culture and they become, you know, suddenly famous, which happens all the time these days, it's only a little while before they fall and people are quite happy to bring them down, the same people that might have raised them up. There's lots of dangers that occur, lots of tigers to face, in the process of becoming oneself. Thank you for listening to and supporting Living Myth. You can further support this podcast by becoming a member of Living Myth Premium. Members receive bonus episodes each month, access to the full archives of nearly 600 episodes, and a 30% discount on all events, courses, and book and audio titles. Learn more and join this growing community of listeners at patreon.com slash living myth. If you enjoy this podcast, we appreciate you leaving a review wherever you listen and sharing with your friends. On behalf of Michael Mead and all of us at Mosaic, we wish you well in the new year and we thank you for your support of our work.